Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. So today I want to talk about a question I get asked a lot, and that is, when are you done with treating your room? Like, when can you stop? When have you done enough? And I've been thinking about this ever since I was first asked this question. I've been thinking about this for quite a lot, and I found it's quite difficult to answer. But uh, here's what I came up with. So first off, there are no measurable objective stats, in my opinion, that will tell you when you're done. Instead, it's being able to rely on your speakers and being able to trust your speakers that tells you that you're done. Let me explain what I mean by that. So obviously we have control room concepts like live end, dead end, non-environment, and so on. And they are, to some extent, sort of linked to very uh, concrete goals that you need to reach in order to implement this, this control room concept, the solution. But that in itself isn't, uh, it doesn't tell you that you have done enough to be able to work reliably and get your mixes to translate. I think that's one of the, the kind of misconceptions about acoustics anyway, that you just treat your room and your mixes will automatically translate. Mix translation is a skill that you learn. So it's kind of like race car driving. You know, I like that analogy. So you still need to learn how to drive the car when you want to race a car. Just because you get into a really specked out fast car doesn't mean you're gonna do a quick lap. You still need to learn how to drive it. And so it's kind of the same here. Acoustics or, 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 or improving the, the acoustics in your room will first of all just mean that your car, your room, or yeah, your car in the analogy will actually turn right when you turn the steering wheel right, okay? So it, it reliably does what you intend for it to do, okay? And that's the same when you're mixing. Your room should tell you, should, should, should tell you honestly what's going on in the music so that when you make an EQ move, for example, when you, let's say, boost the high end or boost the low end or whatever, the, the, the music actually changes in that same way and it, that same change is represented in the same way that you expect it to happen when you take the music out of the room. So your room, is, your, your room and your speakers at that point are honest, are telling you what's actually happened so you can start relying on what's, what they are telling you. And that is ultimately when you are done with treating your room once you are able to rely on your speakers. Now, reaching that goal is a, a, a process that is different for everybody. So some people will need to do more to reach that goal and some people won't need to do as much and still be able to rely on their speakers. But it's something that only you can decide or you need to find out for yourself. Of course, it's easier to learn in a very well-treated room, just like, again, in the race car analogy, it is probably easier to learn how to race a car in a very solid performing car. But once you've learned how to drive or how to mix properly, do you need a fully specked out, super well-treated room in order to rely on what you're hearing and in order for your mixes to translate? I'm not sure. That's Again, that's different for everybody. So just to give you kind of a broad idea, from what I've seen, there are a very few people who can literally mix and rely on their speakers in a completely untreated room, but they are the exception to the norm. For most of us, it is definitely beneficial to do some sort of treatment and in order to work properly, most of those same people will actually want to at least cover kind of the, the basics of low end control and reflection control. Once those are fairly well covered, most people are able to mix properly to rely 
on their speakers without, without having to think about it anymore. And then there are the very few at the very top who have the skill and will actually benefit from working in a room that costs six figures and up. But those are kind of like the Formula One drivers of the sound engineering world. And know that even they most likely went through those first two stages as well to get there. So if kind of the, the goal is so loosely defined in a way and is so different for everybody, what about what the least is that you can or you need to do in order to be able to work properly? And I think there we definitely have a very kind of defined status that you might, or a state, yeah, that you want, might want to reach. I call it the minimum workable setup. And it's all it is, is, as I've talked about many times, placing your listening position and your speakers. Because if you do that correctly, then you will already have managed to balance out the frequency response, the tonality of your system, the best you can under the circumstances of your empty room. You've sort of gotten the, the most out of your speakers, out of your room and your speakers, by just looking at listener and speaker placement, right? So again, it's about tonality, it's about frequency balance with your listening position controlling the low end balance and your speaker positions uh, controlling kind of the mid and high frequency balance. And then obviously on top of things also the stereo image and the sound stage you get between your speakers. Now, this will be a very compact setup because as I talked about in the last video, you want to be in the near field of your speakers in order to reduce the impact the room has as much as possible. And that means in an empty room being very, very close to your speakers. So usually something like two or three feet. So within a meter from your ears to your speakers, your tweeters. But it is a, a functional setup. If you do it right, you will be able to work even in an untreated room. It won't be able, it won't be great, but it will be the best you can do without actually doing anything else, any changes to the actual room. So in summary, again, if you're thinking about, if you want to figure out how far you need to take treatment of your room, don't expect any kind of numbers, any measurements to tell you when you're done. You need to rely on your work and what your work is telling you about the room to say, to, to define, to tell whether there is still something you might want to change or whether you have done enough. It is really a, a decision that you need to make for yourself and something that you need to find out for yourself. And the most simplistic way to kind of describe that is to say, are, are the changes that I'm making to the music while I mix, while I master, whatever, do they actually happen as well when you take the, the music outside of the studio? Can you hear these same changes happen reliably in the music, all right? Because that means that your speakers are giving you, giving you an honest representation, uh, representation of what's going on. And it's at that point that you can start the process of learning proper mix translation. Mixing and mix translation is still a skill you need to learn. The room won't mix the record for you. It'll only make the job quicker and easier. Now, if you want to find out how you can figure out the minimum workable setup in your room, which is basically what I recommend you do in any studio, the first thing you need to do and the, the main thing to focus on before anything else, make sure you download my home studio treatment framework, which are the five steps that I go through in order to treat a room and get it to translate. Obviously, that's a bit of a slogan here. Like I said, mixed translation is a process that you need to, or a skill that you need to learn yourself. But obviously the room supports that process. And if you wanna figure out how I treat rooms, make sure you download that at the link in the description. As always, that's it for now. Thanks for watching, see you soon.